Good morning. Let's open our Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. I want to start with a quick thought from Proverbs 22.1. But it says, a good name is more valued than gold, yes, than fine gold. In ancient times and in our own, parents take great care in the naming of their children. At least most parents do. I found these names. There's a family with the last name Knack, K-N-A-C-K, so they named their daughter Alma. Alma Knack, get it? <laughs> ah. Family with the last name Ball, her name was Crystal. <laughs> One family with the last name Guy, so they named their son Christian. He's the Christian guy. I found an Asian family, it was interesting, their last name was Sung, so they named their son Sam. <laughs> Sam Sung. This gentleman is 58 years old, Bud Light. <laughs> My favorite was the family that had the last name Dover and named their son Ben. All right, now we should really close in prayer and go home. But in ancient times, as in ours, parents usually take great care in the naming of their children. And what they want to do is communicate to the child how unique they are, how special they are. And this is done with the hope that the child will live in accordance with their name. For example, in the Old Covenant, the, the name Rachel. Rachel means pure. Caleb, a great example, bold and faithful. And we do that to say to the child, I pray that you'll live like who you are, that you'll be bold, faithful, pure. And it's okay to do that, and it's wonderful to do that. But that's not what this verse is saying. This verse is not naming somebody and asking them to live up to their name. This is talking about a person who lives so uniquely that they're given a name. Make sense? It's talking about a reputation, a good name, a good reputation, a good life is greater than gold, yes, than fine gold. Francis Schaeffer put it this way, in light of the finished work of Jesus on our behalf, he asked this question, how shall we then live? We've been given new life from God with the intention by God that this new life would be lived, experienced in us, expressed through us, and that would produce confidence when he comes back and assurance during his delay. So that's what we're going to see today in 1 John 3. Two simple points, confident assurance. Let's do a little biblical observation from 1 John 2, verse 28. Look at that verse. And now little children abide in him. We pointed out last time that little children is being used by John to introduce a new thought in his narrative. In chapter 2, verse 1, he said, little children, I'm writing to you so that you wouldn't sin. In 2.12, he said, I'm writing to you so that you'll know your sins are forgiven. In 2.18, he wrote, I'm writing to you little children so you'd be warned that there are deceivers and false teachers out there. So when we come to that little phrase, little children, it should alert us to the fact that we're entering into a new topic. He makes this doubly clear by adding the word now. Now, little children. And if you do some observation, look at verse 28, and then skip down to 3-2, you'll see that we're talking about the appearance of Christ. All that to say very simply that the chapter-verse division isn't as good as it could have been. Remember, those are not in the original text. I think chapter 3 actually begins in chapter 2, verse 28. Make sense? And that's the way we're going to treat it today. So he's going to introduce two thoughts today. Very simple outline. Chapter 2, verse 28 through 3, 6. I'm writing to you, little children, because I want you to be confident when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And then in verse 7, you'll see little children again. I'm writing to you, little children, because I want you to have assurance in your heart of your salvation while he delays his return. So confidence at his appearing, assurance until he appears. That's what he's going after today. And those are two good things to have in our heart as we journey through a dark world, isn't it? So let's pray. Father, the Apostle John, writing as a papa, writing as a father to little kids, wanting to share the deepest passions of his heart in such a way that little kids can understand and appropriate to their lives. So, Father, may that happen in our lives, even now, as we're afforded this wonderful opportunity 
to almost have him stand before us as a papa in the faith and say to us, little kids, please listen. Little kids, please, please listen. Father, by your spirit, we'll accomplish that today, and we trust you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So first of all, let's talk about having confidence when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Look at verse 28. Little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Little children, and you might want to circle that word, very important word in the New Testament, abide in him. It's a word used only by John, and abide means literally to abide. Isn't that exciting? (laughs) To dwell, to live in, or to remain, or to stay put. Now, it's used in the New Testament two ways. One is as a noun. One is as a stated fact of reality. For example, in 1 John chapter 4, we know that we abide in him because we have the Holy Spirit. In this case, then, abiding is not something we do. It's something we have. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. He's promised to never leave us or forsake us. So abiding in him is a stated reality that's true of our lives right now and will always be true of our lives, right? We have an abiding and it never ever goes away. Wonderful. But it's also used as a verb, as an action or something we are to do. John 15 says, abide in him. Now, We can't use it now as the noun. That would be like me telling you to get in this room. Well, that's insane. I'm already in the room. So this is where we would translate it and should translate it differently. Instead of abide, it should be stay put. And so what he's really saying is this, and I want you to notice how I illustrate this. We abide in him, always have abided in him since the moment of faith, and always will abide in him. But stay put. See, the great danger for us is that you and I can look for life in sources other than him. We can get our eyes off of him like we saw last week and look at the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, counterfeit life sources. So when we do that, notice how I'm doing this? We never lose our abiding. We are always in him. He is always in us. But I'm choosing to find life in a source that's not really going to bring me life. Does that make sense? So this is what he's saying. Stay put. Don't look for life elsewhere so that, purpose clause, you may not be ashamed at his return. What does that mean? Well, the return of Jesus provides us with the opportunity for either momentary glory or momentary grief. Notice those words. If we're abiding in him at the moment of his return, i.e. not looking for life anywhere but in him, when the Lord Jesus returns, we will stand confidently in that moment. He shows up, we're living in him, we're not going to the far country, he's momentary glory. That's exciting, well done, good and faithful servant, and immediately ushered into perpetual glory for all eternity. Wonderful. But, what if we've journeyed to the far country in the moment? We haven't lost our abiding, but I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. And the Lord Jesus Christ shows up. (laughs) Kind of like a kid caught with his hand in the cookie jar momentary drawing back, momentary shrinking back that ushers in then perpetual glory. Does that make sense? I had a personal illustration of shrinking back. It popped into my memory banks today. I was sharing with somebody about their shirt, how it was striped, and it looked, I think, reminds me of when I went to jail as a kid. And then I had to tell the story. I had this little girlfriend, and her dad was a sergeant in the LAPD. Well, we were doing some teenage stuff and got arrested. So we brought down to the local precinct, and guess who was at the front desk? (laughs) Her dad. (laughs) Working away, looks up, and then the shrinking took place. (laughs) Frank, what are you doing here? That relationship didn't last very long. (laughs) Temporary drawing back, but then entering in to perpetual glory. That's all he's saying. He confirms this in verse 29 by saying, look, he is righteous, Jesus. And so every one of him who does righteousness 
is born of him. The nature of the life that is inside of us is a righteous life. So it's anticipated that we would express that. But here's John's point. Even when we don't, and we choose in the moment to live an unrighteous life, it doesn't alter our standing in him in any way. Now, how many of you know that's a very dangerous message? It is so dangerous that a lot of churches refuse to preach it. Because they're so wanting to keep the body of Christ from sin that they proclaim a false message. If you sin, you're going to fall out of fellowship. Or worse yet, if you sin, you're going to lose your salvation. No, the true message is you can sin. It'll never alter your standing with God. And John's point is the very fact that that's true is the one that ought to motivate us to not sin. That we're so secure and so loved. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Look what he does. Behold! See his word choice? Do you see it? Do you see it? Look! Look! Behold, what manner of love is this? This God whom the Old Testament calls a consuming fire loved us while we were enemies, brought us into adoption as sons, made us his own children by birth. The New Testament teaches both. Not only were we adopted, we were born from above. And he continues to love us as his kids, even when we don't act like his kids. Isn't that true for you with your kids? You love them, even when they do something wrong. Now, in that moment, you might not like them. You might wish they were somebody else's kids. But you never stop loving them. Where do you think we get that? We get that from God. And John says, what manner of love is this? Look at verse 1. That's why the world wants nothing to do with us, because it wanted nothing to do with him. These two realities... John is putting forth as proof that we have come to know God. Reality number one, we live righteously. Reality number two, the world does not know us any more than they did not know him. John's wanting to instill into our hearts, affirming again and again and again with repetition, their identity is not found in our behavior, but in our relationship to God. Listen. Listen. There are a lot of identifying declarations made on our behalf in the New Testament. We are called the children of God. That's wonderful, isn't it? We're called believers. We're called brethren. We're called soldiers. We're called living letters, ambassadors, a holy nation, royal priesthood, peculiar people. All of those are wonderful. In my heart of hearts, more wonderful is the identifying factor saint. Holy One of God, the incredible New Testament reality that God would look at the like of us and say, holy. But to me, even better than that, most wonderful of all our identities, beloved. Beloved. Because we wouldn't have been made saints if he didn't first love us. And he loved us so much, he would go to the extent to make a sense so that he could have a relationship with us. In 1 John, we saw a couple weeks ago, we are loved. We are the beloved of God. And what did he add? And such we really, really are. It's hard to believe sometimes, but it's true. Now, if you notice verse 2, we are the children of God, beloved. Now, it doesn't appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We will see him as he is, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. In other words, let me put it to you in a different way. We're all in a process. There, there's, we don't always live according to who we are. Now, there's coming a day when he comes back that we will know fully by experience who we are because we'll be able to shed the flesh we'll be forever separated from sin we'll put on glorified bodies and then we will be like him we'll finally be able to to love the way we always wanted to but didn't seem to and every man who has this confidence it's coming it may have been delayed 2,000 years gang but that just means it's closer to the event 
It's coming. And when it does, we will be like him. And because that's true, we start becoming like him even now. We bring all our resource of the Holy Spirit into play and the choice of our will to express a life that is like his. You ever heard that adage, the highest form of praise is imitation? I want to make one clarification. We don't imitate him, right? That's an old covenant economy. Be like God. We express him. He has an inimitable life. It can't be imitated. But he put that life in us so that it could be expressed through us. Now, look at that language. When he appears. What are we talking about there? Future. We're talking prophecy. Now, how many of you know the church loves prophecy? I've been doing what I do for a long time, and I want to tell you the greatest attendant uh, events in church are prophecy events. It makes me wonder when we finally do the book of Revelation, what's going to happen to our attendance here? It'll probably outdo Song of Solomon, which means prophecy sells better than sex. (laughs) Why is it that we want to know the future? I think it's tied to that idea that we want to be like God. We want to be in the know. We don't want to be surprised. We want to be in control. We want to know what's going to happen. But according to the New Testament, the issue is not knowing what's going to happen. The issue is what's happening now. It's not, I know what, it's I know how to live. The Apostle Peter put it this way, since we know these things to be true, and in the context, it's that he is coming, that we're going to be glorified, that our sin's going to be done away with completely in experience. Then he asked this question, what manner of people ought we to be? Just like Francis Schaeffer put it, how shall we then live. Let me put it a different way. John is functioning here as a man on a mission, as a father desperate for his children to understand the seriousness of what he's saying to them. So he says what's on his heart over and over again in as many diverse ways as he can. One writer described the book of first John as a circular staircase. He keeps coming back to the same topic over and and over. Now hear me on this, please. I believe that's truth. I believe they're right. And that means we have a danger. We're tempted to say as we go through John, here we go again. John, you already said that five verses ago. You're like a broken record, John. Please don't do that. Instead, look at the heart of the man who wrote and gain his passion. And I think with his passion, it can bring tolerance of his repetition. Does that make sense? He's basically grabbing each and every one of us by the shirt collar and saying, hear me, hear me, hear me. So what does he have next for our plates? Well, he says, I say this so that you have confidence at his return. Now, my little children, what I'm about to write, I'm writing so you'll have assurance right now. Look at verse 4. Whoever commits sin transgresses the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, that is a very bad translation. Whoever commits sin. It really should be the word practices sin. And when you practice sin, you transgress the law. What he's really saying is this, and sin is lawlessness. The act of sin is one thing. The practice of sin is a manifestation of the heart. To stumble into sin, to be tempted and fall, I don't want to minimize it, but we could call it a mistake, a decision contrary to who we really are in the moment. But a lifestyle of sin is a manifestation of a rebellious heart. Knowing what to do and and doing it anyway. Knowing what not to do and not doing it anyway. And so he's saying we gain assurance when we don't practice sin. That's one. We gain assurance when we don't practice sin. Secondly, 
We gain assurance, verse 5, because we know he took away our sin. Look at the language. But you know. You know, you know, you know. Over and over again, he'll put it into our heart and mind. He took away our sins, and in him is no sin. He's the one and only one who was qualified to do that. It goes back to John the Baptist's message. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sins. Our sins are not just covered. Remember that Old Testament concept? Atonement. Our sins have been taken away. How far away? As far as the east is from the west. Ponder that, my friends. Let that sink into your brain. John wants us to understand this. That's an infinite line. Going completely this way for all eternity. Going this way for all eternity. He says, that's you on one end. That's your sin on the other. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There it is. I want you, you know, we hear that word. And so what I did this week, I looked into that word. We use it without thinking about it. Hallelujah is a compound Hebrew word from Hillel, which means praise. And Yah, which is the shortened form of Yahweh, the covenant name of God. Do you realize what hallelujah is saying? The only one who can actually say it and mean it and understand it and experience is a believer. Who has come to know God as my Yahweh and therefore the covenant keeper, I will praise him. And if there's one thing to praise him for, gang, make sure it's that our sin is gone gone really really gone do you know why that's so important because my friend Juan Carlos Ortiz said the devil made Xerox copies and keeps trying to remind us and you know what I know about people because I know it about me we don't even need the devil to help us sometimes we do a pretty good job of remembering ourselves and it comes down to a choice. Are we going to let the enemy remind us and ourselves remind us? Or are we going to believe God that they're really, really gone? And stand in assurance before the accuser, before the world, and look it in the mirror and claim what God says is true. I am forgiven. So forgiven, my sin is not even in the mind of God. He chooses to not remember. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so verse 6, when you abide in him, dirt of present, you, you, you just don't go on sinning, not as a practice. If you go on sinning, what you're really doing is manifesting that you don't know him. Because the one who's come to know him has made a decisive break with sin. You got put in Christ and crucified and you died to sin. And sin is no longer your master. It's now a choice. It's a choice we make every once in a while. But a true believer doesn't make that choice as a lifestyle. Verse 7. A third assurance. We gain assurance because we live righteously. The very life we live assures us of who we are. See, beware, there are people out there, little children, who are trying to deceive you. The Gnostics, remember? Sin doesn't matter. Sin's in the body. Your spirit is what really matters. You can do whatever you want. No, no, that's not what John says. John says the one who does righteous is righteous and gains assurance of who he is. And we do that because we have a righteous life inside of us. The one who commits sin, look at verse 8. There's that bad translation again. It's not commits. It's practice. See, if it's commits, you're going to read it that way, that when you stumble into sin, you just lost your salvation. Or you stumble into sin and you say, I must not be a Christian. And I know there are people who, who do that, right? How could I be a Christian and do what I just did? Those words sound familiar to you? It is not commits sin. It's practices sin. A lifestyle of rebellion. That one. That one is proving he is, look, source from or of the devil. And this goes back to Jesus' words. Good trees produce good fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. That's all it is. The pattern of our lives, pattern, proclaims who we really are. And so what we do is when we stumble into sin and the enemy comes along and says, you must not be a Christian to have done that. We say, no, look at the pattern of my life. That's not the pattern. 
That was something I stumbled into. Might have stumbled into it for a little while even. But it's not who I am. Verse 9. A fourth assurance. We have assurance right now because we're not haters. But lovers. We've been transformed. Look at the language. The one who hates his brother is in the darkness. Can that ever be said of a believer? No, we are in the light. Now, as those in the light, we can walk after the darkness every once in a while. But we don't live in darkness. That phrase is reserved for an unbeliever. The light is in us, gang, and that's why the light is going to shine through us. I think we would look at the prodigal. He went to the far country, didn't he? Could he stay there? No, he couldn't stay. Why? Because he's not a pig. He's a son. And when he looked at his life, he said, wait a minute, I'm a son, not a pig. What am I doing here? And he headed for home. That is a classic illustration of what John is trying to communicate to our hearts. Look what he says in verse 11. This is the message. This is the way it's been from the beginning of Jesus when he first showed up and taught it. Nothing has changed. The message has always been love. Remember when they hired an attorney, the Jews, to go up and use the law against him? And they said, great teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Ready to trap him? And what did Jesus say? Oh, my attorney, my dear legal expert, you're confused. There's not one. There's two. Love God, love people. This sums up what? The whole law. The law is all wrapped up in that word love. First four commandments, love towards God. Next six, love towards people. And why did they bring death to us? Because they showed us that we couldn't love apart from God and we needed God and we were lost in sin. It's so simple. As in his illustration, he, he brings up Cain. Cain is from the evil one. You say, how do we know that? Well, he hated his brother, verse 12. His brother Abel lived a righteous life. Abel obeyed God. God said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And apparently, God had instructed people that when you worship, you bring blood. Remember back in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve first sinned, what did they do? Covered. What did they cover with? Fig leaves. God said, nope. You sinned. You chose law. Law brought death. Something has to die in order for redemption. So he killed an animal and clothed them in animal skins. And then he set up an entire system where blood would be shed as a covering, pointing to the day when the, finally one would come and spill his blood and not cover but remove. And so they were apparently instructed what to do. Abel brought a blood offering. Cain brought an offering of horticulture, plants. He was a farmer. God did not regard his offering. So what did Cain do? You're right, God, I'm sorry, let me go get an animal. That's not what he did. Instead, he rose up against his brother. Why? Because darkness hates the light, always will. Rather than darkness coming to the light, John says they love the darkness, so they stay in the darkness, and what do they do instead? Get rid of the light. So he murdered his brother. Do not be surprised, John says in verse 13, a fifth way of assurance, when the world hates you, because the world hated Christ. That's how we know we pass from death into life. The world hates us, doesn't love us. Jesus said in the, in the Gospels, if you were of the world, the world would have loved you. Instead, the world murders because they don't know love. Verses 13 through 15, a sixth assurance. We lay down our lives for others. Look at verse 16. I think this is one of the most neglected verses in the entire Bible. By this we perceive the love of God. Twofold, look at it. Because he laid down his life for us, that's John 3, 16. 1 John 3, 16, and we now lay down our lives for the brethren. 
I told you this story years ago, Epaphroditus out in Philippians 2. Remember when we went through that book? Paul sent Epaphroditus home. He had been sent to minister with Paul. Paul sent him home. Why, was he failing? No. He had so laid down his life that Paul used a word and he said he risked his life for the kingdom that he had gotten desperately ill. The word risked his life is the Greek word parabaluamai. It means to gamble. He gambled his life. My friends, later in the second century, there was a group of people that were reading Philippians that came across that phrase, Epaphroditus, the parabolu, the parabolani. They gave themselves a name. We will be the gamblers. We will be the ones like Epaphroditus, who will risk our lives. And so in the second century, when a plague broke out in Pisidian Antioch, and everybody fled the city, the Parabolani, the gamblers, went into the city to share Christ, those people before they died. We had a modern-day example of this, don't we, with New York City and 911, when everybody was rushing out of those buildings, those first responders ran in. Parabolani. Gambling their lives. Paul says, John says, this is how we know. This is how we have assurance. Before we believe we're believers, we used to guard our lives. We used to cling to our lives. We used to not let anybody rob us of anything that might be life. But now we're in Christ. We have sufficiency on the inside. We already have all we need. So we now lay down our lives. We're the modern-day parabolani. Now, to make it practical, look what he says next. Let me illustrate it in a plain, simple fashion. If you have the world's goods and see your brother has needs, what do you do? You give him the world's goods. But if you shut up compassion for him, then how does the love of God dwell in you? See, we know that we have assurance of our salvation because we lay down our lives for the brethren. In other words, in the New Testament, love is a verb, not a noun. See, in our English language, we use love as a noun, but in Greek, it's, it's a verb. You all know 1 Corinthians 13. I know you do. It's probably read at your wedding. That's how we use it, by the way, in our modern church culture. But that's not what it was for. It was actually marching orders for every single believer. Now, it sounds like an adjective, Adjective is that which follows the verb defining the noun. Didn't know you were going to get an English lesson today, did you? So we translate it this way. Love is kind. Love is patient. Love is not boastful. But in the Greek, that's not how it is. They're actually participles. And a participle is a verb that functions as an adjective. So it should be translated this way, Michael. Love is being kind. Love is being patient. Love is not being boastful. Do you hear the point? In other words, let me put it to you real simple. Love in Greek is an action. In other words, according to the New Testament, you cannot say you love if you do not do love. Watchman Nee put it this way. We have no right to say that we have come to know something until it changes the way we live. And so John is saying we are lovers, therefore we love. You may say you love, but if you don't provide, lay down your life for another, then John would answer it really isn't love. You can't remain selfish anymore because that old self died. It's not who you are. Whereas our natural inclination before was to preserve. Now it's to preserve others. Now, doesn't mean we don't preserve here. Philippians 2, what does it say? We look not only on our own needs. What is he saying? It's okay to look on your own needs. I'm glad that was added, aren't you? It's okay. But we also look on others now. Wonderful. A seventh assurance, verse 19. We know that we have assurance of faith because our heart no longer condemns us. Now, there are times when we fail where our heart is going to condemn us. It's going to say, you know, you're not living according to who you really are. But what does he say? For those times, we have confidence towards 
God when he ministers that to us when our heart does condemn us. Wonderful. In other words, the bottom answer is not what you think, it's what God thinks. Does that make it clear? You may say, boy, I'm a real jerk for what I just did. And God says, no, you're a child of God who did a jerky thing. Think correctly. Think correctly. An eighth assurance, we get answered prayer. He hears our prayers and answers them. Look at verse 22. Whatever we ask, we receive because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Remember Jesus, what did he say? What father having a son asked for bread would give him a stone? He said, your heavenly father knows what you need before you even ask. Now here he says, whatever we ask, we receive because we keep his commandments. Wait a minute. What does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like performance? If you keep his commandments, I'll give you whatever you ask. That sounds like we're manipulating the hand of God. Mm -mm. It's not what it's about at all. When we are walking in the will of God, what he's saying is we will ask in accordance with the will of God. This is a relational issue, not a performance issue. Let me illustrate it. If my child comes to me and says, hey, dad, can I have $50 to go buy a couple cases of beer? That request is not in harmony between his heart and my heart. Make sense? What if he came to me instead and said, hey, dad, I'm a little short this week. Can I have $50 to go buy mom some flowers just because? See the difference? It's not so much the request. It's the heart that asks the request. And I would put it this way. As a new covenant believer, we have hearts that want to please God. And God has a heart that longs to give. And when those two are in accordance, the beauty of heaven invades our lives. And he answers our prayer. Because we've asked in accordance with his own heart. Wonderful. A ninth way of assurance. Verse 23 and 24. Simply because we're obedient. And what is that obedience? We believe in his name. This goes back to John 6. Do you remember when the disciple came to Jesus and said, what must I do to work the works of God? What did Jesus say? Believe. Because the new covenant economy is not so much us doing for God as us living from God. And you're never going to live from God until you have God. And you're never going to have God until you believe in God. Make sense? Verse 24. And he that keeps his commandments dwells in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given. I want to leave you with one final thought. I want you to stop and ponder this word, abide. You know, it may not be a word you heard a lot in church growing up. But it's a word that we hear a lot here at Grace Life because it's what the essence of the new covenant is all about. It's a life that is shared. We share the life of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Talk about a neglected verse. I never heard that growing up. I was taught that here I was, there was God, and we were so far away. This ought to be the biggest verse in the New Testament for the church. No, it's exactly the opposite of that. This far away God came near, and this lowly wretch got lifted up, and now we met in Christ, and we are one spirit together. I didn't become God. That's heresy. God did not become me. That's heresy. I believe with all my heart, God gave us marriage to help us understand this. I married Janet. Janet married me. I didn't become Janet. Janet didn't become me, even though I tried to make her become me. <laughs> We remain two, yet we're one. You could look and say, there goes Frank and Janet. You could also say, there go the Freedmans. Both would be correct. What's the glory of this? Listen, please listen. 
Everything Janet brought to the union now belongs to me. And everything I brought to the union still belongs to me. That's not how it's supposed to be. It now belongs to her. Everything we brought to the union, the sin, the guilt, the shame, the failure, it all belongs to him. And everything he brought to the union, his life, his love, his righteousness, his goodness, his kindness, it all belongs to me. We abide in him. My caution to you, beloved ones of Grace Life. Yes, we use this word so much here because we want it here so that it can be here, so that it can be here. I fear, my fear is we use it so much it becomes commonplace around here. Oh yes, we're abiding, we're abiding, we're abiding. Don't ever lose the awe and the wonder that the living God of the universe has humbled himself to be in union with you through the person and finished work of Christ and the indwelling spirit of God. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Father, this was a hard passage for the preacher today. John was so repetitious. I agree, he's a circular staircase saying the same thing in a different way over and over and over. But I think by the time we get to the end of it, we understand why. He wants us to understand that the likes of us in this room, through Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit, are in union with the living God. Just like Jesus prayed, I in them, they in me, I in the Father, they in the Father, all one in him. Mystery, mystery, but experiential reality. Moment by moment being changed into the image of Christ in experience where we already are in identity and position and life in reality. We are stunned, and so we worship. And if we don't shout hallelujah from our lips, may we live it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.